Good afternoon, I'm Vashon Brown with the Midday News. A special welcome if you're watching on OneSpotMedia.com. Councillor for the Trafalgar Division, Carrie Douglas, has been charged for breaching the curfew order which was imposed to limit the spread of the coronavirus. The councillor confirmed that she was last night charged under the Disaster Risk Management Act and with disorderly conduct. The councillor explains that she was stopped on her way home after attending to the needs of some vulnerable persons in her division. She said she left the constituency sometime before 9 o'clock. Just about two blocks from my house, I was pulled over by members of the JCF, ordered me out of my vehicle, to which I complied, asked me the reason I was on the road and whether or not I was aware of the curfew. So I told them I was aware of the curfew. However, I was exempt as a councillor of a municipal corporation. They asked me to provide my identification. I told them that I had my driver's license on me as identification. He said he did not want to see that. He wanted to see a KFAMC issued ID, which I did not have on me at the time. I told him that it was no secret, being a public elected representative, that I was indeed a councillor and that he could just make a call or two to verify. Also, I received a call from the town clerk and the mayor. Well, I called them, actually. And having done that, they tried to also help in terms of identifying me to no avail. Meanwhile, four persons were arrested in St. Thomas between Monday and last night for failing to comply with the curfew order. The police say a man and a woman were arrested in Hampstead, while another man was arrested in Poor Man's Corner. The fourth individual was arrested in Yalla Square. Several other persons were warned for prosecution. And Prime Minister Andrew Holness has announced that the government will extend the current island-wide nightly curfew. Other measures to address the COVID-19 pandemic, including work from home, closures of the island's borders and others, will also be extended in accordance with the relevant orders. Now, the Prime Minister will give details on the measures during an update to the nation later today. Head of the Mona Geoinformatics Institute at the University of the West Indies Mona Campus, Dr. Paris Lewayi, says communities in Kingston are more susceptible to the transmission of COVID-19. He was speaking at a virtual special select committee meeting on Tuesday. The details in this report. Director of the Mona Geoinformatics Institute at the University of the West Indies, Dr. Paris Lewayi, disclosed that communities located below halfway tree are more at risk to the spread of the COVID-19 in the country. Dr. Leo Ayi, alongside Howard Mitchell and Gordon Shirley, conducted a risk analysis study which revealed that there are more than 40 vulnerable communities in Kingston. Most of the highest scores observed in Jamaica, all of them are in Kingston and all, and all except for Whitehall, the community of Whitehall, are below halfway tree. And that tells us that these are the most at-risk areas uh, in Jamaica, in Kingston, and we can deter determine our own strategies accordingly. As for communities outside of the Kingston metropolitan region, the study revealed that Port Antonio, Spanish Town, and Montego Bay are hotspot areas. West Milan and St. Elizabeth were found to have some vulnerable communities. However, according to the study, the distribution of vulnerable groups are uneven. Vulnerable groups are people with underlying health issues 75 years and over, and persons with little disposable income. Dr. Leo Ayi noted that it is difficult to implement physical distancing, quarantining, and curfews in urban areas. He explained that areas with high population density would increase the likely spread of COVID-19. And when we begin to combine urban areas and the characteristics of urban areas with population, population density, looking at poverty conditions, we're looking at the old age concentration, looking at diabetic and hypertensive, we begin to see very interesting patterns. Norbrook may have certain high level of, of, of a proportion of old people and diabetic and hypertensive, but it doesn't have a very highly dense population and it, does not have, it's not, it doesn't have a very high level of poverty. So the, 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 the common little risk in those areas are different from other, other parts of Kingston and other parts of, of Jamaica. Prince Moore, TVJ News. Businesses and residents in Maypen Clarendon are in the firing line from authorities for failing to observe the physical distancing measures. But while they disobey, one senior parliamentarian is ensuring that he takes steps to stay safe. More in the support from Dwayne Anderson. An order has been in place since March 25 for Jamaicans 75 and older to stay home. 
The measure was put in place by the government to prevent senior citizens from contracting COVID-19. There were exemptions, including for politicians, but questions remained about how these representatives of the people would function. Well, at least one of the older politicians and his team have been taking steps to keep safe. Mike Henry, the member of parliament for Central Clarendon, was noticeably absent from a handover exercise in Maypen on Tuesday. It was the second public event of this nature covered by our news team in recent days in Maypen, where the 84-year-old MP was not among the politicians present. Mr. Henry was represented at Tuesday's event by the younger Joel Williams, who explained the position of the MP during this time. He works sometime from his home uh, in Maypen here. Yeah. Um, but of course, we, um, as the executive of the constituency, we also are aware of uh, what could happen as it relates to this virus. Um, so indeed, we, are, we try to make sure that we don't expose him. While those safeguards have been put in place for the MP, the people he represents are not as careful, especially in the parish capital, Maypen. The police and political directorate blamed the business people for some of the breaches, especially in failing to get the people to space out. We're still having challenges with that, especially in our township, especially for the town of Maypen, where we have a number of businesses still going on. Um, the banks and those areas, we've observed that person is not um, maintaining the social distancing, which is a concern for us. And we have our town enforcement unit that will go through from time to time to try and remind the citizens that it's important at this time that they do so. One here, no, I'm, I'm disappointed with the banks. I'm expecting that the banks should be one institution that be able to manage this 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 situation in a better way. I'm not I'm not happy with what I'm seeing at those at, at those institutions. They were speaking Tuesday following the handover of $5 million worth of goods to the police and hospitals by the Maypen business community. Dwayne Anderson, TVJ News. At least one group is requiring special attention from the government in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. Craft vendors say some persons within the sector are not paying taxes, hence they fall outside the bracket for financial help for the sector. But Finance Minister Dr. Nigel Clark says there will be some special requests which will be granted. He made the announcement this morning during TVJ's Smile Jamaica. We're providing for the people who are selling in the market. And remember, what the program is focused on are, are the vulnerable, the people at the bottom of the income scale. So the craft vendor is at a different level of income from the craft producer, okay? And so our first intervention is at the person in the market, the person who is at the bottom of the earning scale, and we are providing an intervention for them. Once we have done that, we can look and say, all right, you know, look at the producer. Yes, we have something for the small business uh, who is registered and who is paying taxes, um, and if the craft producer falls in that category, then they can, uh, they can apply to the small business grant. But otherwise, we're focused at the persons who are at the bottom of the income scale. That's what we have to do at this time to provide a cushion for those who are less likely to have the resources saved. And, and that's what but that's not to say that the person who has asked this question, we won't be able to find something for them. But allow us to deal with the hundreds of thousands first. Dr. Clark also maintains that the financial downturn during being experienced across most sectors due to the COVID-19 pandemic will be temporary. He says the government is ensuring that the country is in a position to make a quick recovery. In the meantime, Dr. Clark says Jamaicans will be able to apply under the COVID-19 allocation of resources for employees care program for benefits when the website goes live online tomorrow. Now the website is www.wecare.gov.jm. That's www.wecare.gov.jm. Now the cutoff date for application is June 30. And we now take a break on the midday news, but we'll be right back. Please stay with us. Welcome back. Continuing the news now. 
In less than three months, the St. Catherine town of Linstead will have a drop-in center to help cater to the many homeless persons, especially those who are mentally challenged. Councillor Herbert Garrix says after much lobbying, the municipal corporation has finally donated lands to house the over 200 people living on the streets of the city. The nurses' quarters behind what used to be a thriving Linstead hospital are being rehabilitated to house the drop-in center. He says having a formal establishment for the homeless will encourage more persons to help to feed and give other assistance to this often overlooked group of people. They will come here when the building is finished to get medication and of course to be fed. So that hopefully in a while, more of our mentally challenged people will go back to normal life. And, and the building will have like two rooms, one for male, one for female, that overnight. It will have a doctor's office. It will have two bathrooms or three bathrooms, one for staff, one for male, one for female. It will have like a recreational area and it will have like a kitchenette, among other things. Concerns are being raised about the lack of physical distancing among Jamaicans when waiting outside business establishments. Now our news team visited several locations across the island on Monday where we observed a common sight, large gatherings and no physical distancing. The government recommended that all citizens remain at least three feet apart, but as we observed, no one was following those guidelines. While the tax office in Port Antonio, Portland had a queue, Persons were still tightly lined up to collect path benefits, even the elderly. And at this NCB ABM next door, there was no orderly conduct, a similar site outside the NCB financial institution. We have four cases on loop on the gallery right now. That means a violator, we have four more. You understand what I'm saying? But you know, they, 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 they line up something. We never like the line of something from Mali. Now, eventually, the police showed up. They observe what is happening out here, the social distance. They know about you. You bet you put sick down your seat. So, look here. Some of you guys wait out there. And it's sick. Wait out there until the time this place free up, then you can come. So, if you don't want me to tell who to wait out there, I can't do it. You understand? So, just observe what is happening. Go back, go back some more. Go back outside. Maintain your social distance. Now, we also visited Yallis in St. Thomas. This was the crowd outside the post office. And at the Crossroads Tax Office in St. Andrew, a similar site. However, there was one location we observed some persons practicing physical distancing. This was the line outside the post office in St. Elizabeth, although persons person's hands were sanitized before they were allowed entry and some people were observed wearing masks and gloves the large crowds are observing cons are raising concerns about the health and safety of citizens questions this afternoon about whether the opposition leader dr peter phillips should have released information about his medical status in a release yesterday it was revealed that dr phillips has been diagnosed with stage 3 colon cancer the revelation by Dr. Phillips has ignited discussion about whether this information should have been made public. At least one member of academia believes the public had a right to know. Assistant lecturer of public policy at the University of the West Indies Mona Campus, Damian Gordon, argues that the post of opposition leader requires public involvement to a certain level. The public should because the opposition is very important to the, the balance of power. You know, um, he, Dr. Peter Phillips is a, is a lawmaker, he's a member of parliament. He has served in um, several ministerial um, capacities. He's a current, he's a leader of the, um, the parliamentary opposition. He's also the president of the People's National Party. Therefore, he assumes very important public functions. And as such, I think it is imperative to know that people to know that your, your public servants are uh, to know of these developments that can impact the ability or the capacity of your public servants to properly discharge your duties.
On to other news now. The Kingston West Police have carried out raids in downtown Kingston, targeting persons behind the recent flare-up of violence in the division. Three persons have been killed and several others injured since Sunday as gunmen traded bullets. The latest victim is 47-year-old Morris McPherson, a resident of Rose Lane. Mr. McPherson was fatally shot in the community on Monday. Head of the Kingston West Police, Superintendent Leighton Gray, told our news center that the violence stemmed from a gang feud. He said since Sunday, there have been reprisal attacks in several communities, including Oxford Street, Rose Lane, Chestnut Lane, and West Street. Superintendent Gray said the police have increased foot and mobile patrols and conducted raids in the communities. A murder suspect was arrested on Monday following a shootout between the police and gunmen on Pink Lane in Denham Town. Actress Loy Kelly Miller died this morning. She was born October 1917. Mrs. Kelly Miller was a close friend of Louise Bennett Coverley. She also lived in Gordontown, St. Andrew. Loy Kelly Miller appeared in several pantomimes and other plays. She was also a former piano teacher. In her 70s, she appeared in the movie Meet Joe Black. Loy Kelly Miller was 102 years old. And here's a preview of what's coming up in this evening's health report. In the next edition of the health report, we look at how persons should sanitize their hands properly, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic. Ideally, it would be better if you maybe did like the ladies and have your little stash of tissues in, or hand towels, um, paper towels. And then as you use one, it is better to discard because... The more times that you use it, the wetter it is, then the more chance that as you sneeze or cough into it, you're actually forcing droplets out of it. So it's better to not reuse or store used um, contaminated items. That's the health report this evening in primetime news. And now for today's health living tip. Squirt some sanitizer into the palm of one hand and rub hands together and thoroughly. Rub sanitizer into both hands. Let hands air dry. Don't wipe them. And use a sanitizer even when your hands are not visibly dirty, such as when you have sneezed or coughed or you have been near a sick person. And the time now for sports. For the first time in its 37-year history, the World Athletics Championships will be held before August as organizers of the 2022 edition in the United States have agreed to stage the event three weeks earlier than planned to avoid a clash with the Birmingham Commonwealth Games. The championships in Eugene, Oregon had already been pushed back a year after the postponement of the summer's Tokyo 2020 Olympics to 2021 because of the coronavirus pandemic. After a week of negotiations, a compromise has been and that's the Midday News. I'm Vashon Brown. Don't forget to join us at 7 for a primetime news package. On behalf of the news, sports and production teams, have a wonderful afternoon.